और एम आर आई ये एक शॉर्ट फॉर्म है जो यकीनन आप कई मरतबा सुन चुके होंगे या इससे इस्तेफादा भी कर चुके होंगे लेकिन इसके पस पर्दा अवामिल और इसके पीछे और इसके लिए इस्तेमाल की जाने वाली टेक्नोलॉजी के बारे में आप लोग शायद बहुत ज़्यादा नहीं जानते होंगे मैग्नेटिक रेजोनेंस इमेजिंग जिसे उर्दू में अगर आप तर्जुमा करें तो कह सकते हैं कि मखनातीसी गूंज के ज़रिए की जाने वाली अक्कासी मखनातीसी गूंज के ज़रिए की जाने वाली अक्कासी ये तिबी साइंस या मेडिकल साइंस की बहुत जदीद टेक्निक है जो कि कई अमराज कई अवारस का पता चलाने में बहुत ज़्यादा कामयाब साबित हो रही है तो आज डॉक्टर साहब इसी मौजू पर लेक्चर देंगे वट एम गोइंग टू टॉक टूडे इज अबाउट ब्रेन हाउ डज ब्रेन अंडरस्टैंड लैंग्वेज एंड हाउ कैन वी मे हाउ कैन वी यूज एडवांस टेक्नोलॉजी टू थ्रो सम लाइट विच हैज लॉट ऑफ बेसिक साइंस एज वेल एज क्लिनिकल इम्प्लीकेशन आई deliberated quite a bit about what to talk <coughs> because i'm usually used to talk in uh, to on a very technical level to folks who specialize in this area uh, but i'll try to keep this as simple as possible and please do not uh, feel shy to interrupt me and ask questions if you need some clarifications i'd like this to be a fun sort of seminar rather than a formal lecture uh where people tend to isolate themselves when i entered your campus driving through this one i noticed this structure i thought it's too beautiful to pass so i took a picture of that one and incorporated into my thought the campus your campus is beautiful and i i hope to see next year the campus grow more uh yeah perhaps it's more beautiful if it's possible the first question comes is when you go to a talk why go to a talk one thing as i said is to ask good questions and hopefully to get to get some good answers i mean i i hope that this would happen today and before i start let me introduce my research group consists of about 25 folks or so at various levels uh why is language so important it's pretty clear that it is one of the pillars of human intellect and its principal means by which we communicate our thoughts uh to each other it plays a crit- critical role in analyzing reasoning solving problems and planning uh our actions it's indispensable part of human culture clearly uh it's vital to individual success as all of us know what happens many of the diseases affecting the affect language which can cripple personal family and soft life uh, for example i'm going to research is aimed at how brain understands uh and interprets language there are two reasons for doing that one is to satisfy our own curiosity to understand uh and improve how brain handles language but there is also very significant clinical implication because many of the diseases like stroke epilepsy and traumatic brain injury so on and so forth can actually affect the ability to speak and comprehend language so the physicians and scientists need to understand how the brain actually is affected how the language is affected by disease to the brain and therefore they can properly institute proper therapies to basically to to or to bring back the skills as much as possible in language impaired uh, individuals which have clearly has a lot of significance as you know in 384 bc aristotle the great uh, greek scientist philosopher thought that the brain is an organ of minor importance perhaps just necessary to cool the heart or cool the blood is heart spray. and in 335 bc um herophilus was the first to correctly identify brain as the source of intellect as we know today it is 130 ad uh 
Gelson, Gelenas was the first to articulate that speech does not come from chest, but basically the brain is the one which controls. And brain does not really cool the heart, contrary to what people used to think. The modern concept of brain is what I like best. It was articulated by Robert Frost, who is a well-known American poet. He said, brain is a wonderful organ. It starts working the moment you get up in the morning and does, does not stop until you get into the office. Once you go to the office, it takes rest. <laughs> this is the moment. This is a picture of human brain. What you notice here is you see the elevations and depressions. The elevations are called gyri, and the depressions are called uh, sulci. And you also notice that there's this very thin layer. This is what we call the dura mater, which basically protects the brain uh, from injury. And within this brain, you have what's called cerebrospinal fluid. It's my, not my intention to make you experts in neuroanatomy in the short time, but these things are perhaps a little bit interesting and important uh, for you to understand what's going on. This is what we call the cerebellum or small brain. This is goes to become the spinal cord. Uh, believe it or not, this is the gray matter. The top of the portion is called gray matter. And this is where all the actions originate on the surface of the brain. If you take the brain and scrape away the top part, the gray matter, then you suddenly see a matter which looks appears sort of whitish, and this is what we call appropriately white matter. I'll come to that in a minute and its importance. If you cut your brain in the horizontal direction, let's say that I cut my brain and try to see what's happening. You notice the, that white matter, that white stuff, that's what we call the white matter. And this is the gray matter. The unit of brain is what's called a neuron or nerve cell, consists of two parts. One is the cell body. You notice that the cell body has a number of projections. These are called dendrites. I'll show what, what they really mean. And in addition, we also have a long filament, what we call the axon, uh, which is surrounded by myelin. Uh, and I don't want to go into the details. The structure may appear a little bit funny, but this brain is what is responsible for us to think fast and act fast. This is called uh, load of Ranvier. And if this is damaged, if the mind is damaged, then the person develops a lot of inabilities, like multiple sclerosis, for example. Uh, if you think that the gray matter, the cell is what is actually made up, makes the gray matter. And the white matter actually is made up of these axons. Uh, if you think that the cell act actually as a battery cell, which generates all the actions, the axon basically acts as a cable or the wire, which actually takes all this information and communicates to different parts of the brain or to different parts of the body. And here is a picture again. This is the cell body. And you have a number of dendrites. And this is the axon. Yeah. So how do different cells in the body communicate with, them, with each other? This is very critical for you to function properly. If you notice that uh, each one of these dendrites makes a contact with the axon, and there's a small chemical called acetylcholine. I don't want to really go into details. But when, you, when the brain acts, it does nothing but to release this chemical. The information then is carried by the axons to different parts of the body or different parts of the brain. And in simplistic way, that's how brain works. Depending on how the bones are organized on your skull, uh, the anatomists have divided brain into a number of lobes. This is the frontal lobe. He has the name in place actually, front of our brain. So, the brain is now divided into a number of parts. One is called the frontal lobe, that's the front part of the brain. And you have the temporal lobe. These are the next, for example, these are the temporal lobes where you have a lot of uh, headaches. Uh, and then this is called occipital lobe, which is responsible for us to see, to transmit the light signal. So when you see something, it's the occipital lobe which is activated. That's how actually you see things and the brain interprets. 
and you have Pons middle oblongata, which basically is an auto autonomous system which is responsible for your heartbeats and for you to breathe without knowing that you are breathing. Uh, and as I said, you also have the parietal lobe, uh, which is particularly important for language. Let, let's look at this brain, which is contained in the skull and scalp. If you look at the size, it's about 140 millimeters wide, and about 167 millimeters long, and 93 millimeters high. So it's, it's a reasonably small size uh, relative to the whole body. Yet, but it weighs anywhere between 350 to 400 grams. Uh, and adult brain averages between about 1300 to 1400 grams. The cerebral cortex, what I showed you with the convolutions on the outer surface, when you open it and stretch it, it almost occupies about 2.23 square meters, which corresponds to area of, let's say, a night table. So, so much of the tissue actually is contained within the brain uh, by convolutions. If you look at the brain composition, again, 70 to 80 percent of the brain is nothing but water, the rest of the components. Its volume, as I said, is about 1400 milliliters. Uh, if you look at the total cerebral cortex volume, the frontal lobe, for example, occupies about 41 percent because the frontal lobe really does most of the job when you recall your memory or when you recall events or when you try to do something, what we call the executive functions, it is the frontal lobe which does it. So not surprisingly, it has the largest volume. There are about 100 billion neurons or nerve cells in the brain. This is the same number as what you find, the number of stars in our galaxies. It's a huge number. Uh, there are about 750 to 1000 milliliters of blood flow through brain every minute. This, is, this corresponds to about three soda cans, Coke cans. That's how much blood flows uh, in every minute. In one minute, brain consumes about, 40, about 46 cubic centimeters of oxygen, out of which the gray matter actually uses about 94, predominantly because that's where all the actions originate. So that's how, that's how those are some of the facts. What are some of the fun facts, human brain? Cognitive tests show that about 30% of 80-year-olds perform as well as young adults. So if you get too old, don't be despaired. You can still think and you can still do a good job. Uh, about 2% of our total body weight, the brain actually weighs about 2% of the total body, but uses about 20% of the energy that body actually consumes. It's huge amount of energy. Uh, it generates, for example, if you plug in, not that you want to do it, it can light up a 25 watt bulb brain. I mean, that's how much energy actually we generate. It generates more electrical impulses in one day than all the telephones in the world. So you can imagine what sort of how active the brain is. Uh, it produces about 70,000 thoughts per day. Uh, after age, 30 brains start shrinking what we call atrophy. Uh, this is a normal sort of a growth pattern. If you look at Albert Einstein's brain, it weighs about 1230 grams, which is significantly smaller than the average brain of 13 to 14 grams. So it's not that larger brain not, does not necessarily translate into a genius. Uh, so again, if you have a small brain, don't worry. You can still be powerful. How do we know how the brain works? This is what we call brain mapping. What happens is different parts of the brain are responsible for different functions. They specialize. For example, if you want to speak, certain part of the brain gets activated. If you want to listen, certain part. If you want to move your hands, another part gets activated. Uh, brain mapping allows to identify which part of the brain is responsible for which function. Why is it so important? It's extremely important in clinical sense. Something happens to part of the brain, and something happens to your speech, for example, let's say, or comprehension of language, then the phys physician needs to know what's going on so that he or she can appropriate, appropriately intervene uh, and help the patient. Uh, at the same time, even though the action is local, 
still the brains have to communicate, different parts of the brain have to communicate with each other. Meaning thereby that it's a network. In other words, it's both local as well as a network. That's what makes it fascinating. One way the brain scientists try to understand which part of the brain is responsible for which action is what we call selectively lesioning. And that's what they do is they selectively disconnect a part of the brain or injure that part of the brain and see which aspect of your function has been, um, is compromised. For example, if I go to Wernick's well, area, I'll come to that in a minute, and destroy that, then the person cannot speak. Okay? Similarly, if something happens in the frontal lobe, then the person really cannot think properly and execute various day-to-day -day routines. Uh, of course, clearly this is possible only in animals, because no human is going, is going to agree to get part of his brain damaged to contribute to research or to contribute to our understanding. One of the ways to do is, you look at large number of patients, let's say stroke patients, and see what are the effects of, this, of the stroke on language or on motor movement, so on and so forth, and draw inferences. This is how actually we do in humans, to understand which part of the brain causes functional deficit, which function is uh, compromised, and then come back and uh, try to associate that part with that particular function. Uh, there are a number of, as I said, the regional function, each part is responsible for something. This is, <coughs> the whole thing is called cerebrum, and the lower brain or small brain is what's called the cerebellum. And again, for example, you look at thoughts and uh, communication. This is the frontal lobe is responsible, and you have the parietal lobe, uh, and which basically called responsible for language and the occipital lobe, which is responsible for the visual sort of signals, and the temp the cerebellum, for example, is communications and so on and so forth. So the important thing is different parts of the brain have different functions. I want to show you this in terms of uh, a cartoon. If you look at here, you see these are, this is the brain I have shown you in the beginning, the convolutions, remember, gyra and sulci. For example, if you look at this part of the brain, that's almost close to the midline hemisphere, this part actually controls the foot, and this part of this gray matter controls the hip, and this actually controls the trunk, part of the body. This is arms, and hand, face, tongue, larynx, so on and so forth. In as different parts of that small looking tissue is responsible for different parts of the body. You can actually elaborate a little more and see which corresponds to small finger, which corresponds to ring fingers, little finger. So this is how actually we map the brain and get some sort of idea what actually, actually is happening. The selective lesion, one of the things I said was basically take the brain and damage part of the brain and see what's going on. But clearly it's not feasible uh, in humans. Here is an example in animals. You know that many of the, the reason why we get addicted to drug, alcohol or whatever that is, or sex, is because there is circuit in the brain which is called the pleasure circuit. It derives pleasure or gratification or reward. So if, for example, if you somehow damage that circuit, see the red and the blue, and if you damage that one in animals, the animals actually suddenly, they don't have any craving for drugs anymore. In other words, you are basically by destroying the reward seeking circuit, you are taking away the addiction, some sense. I mean, obviously we can't do it in humans, not yet anyway. The language mapping, how do we know which part of the brain actually is responsible for language? Language, there are two main traits which distinguishes humans from animals. One is language, and the other thing is deceit. We human we humans, we devise various schemes to cheat others and deceive others. The animals don't have that. So, because the language is unique to humans, we can't use the animal studies to understand how language actually is generated in the brain. The much of the earlier understanding is based on local pathologies such as stroke, traumatic brain injury, and tumors that selectively affect language function, i.e., cause and effect.
which part is responsible for part. The neuroimaging particularly, PET, positron emission tomography, and MRI, and in particular, what we call the functional MRI and diffusion tensor imaging, which are advanced MRI techniques, have tremendously increased, improved our understanding of how human brain comprehends and generates language. In area, there is a disorder called aphasia. What it does is, it's also called aphemia, reflects the loss of ability to produce and or comprehend or understand language. It might be the result of injury to certain brain areas. By systematically studying stroke, brain tumor and other patients, scientists have identified two areas in the brain that are responsible for language. One is called the Broca's area. It governs language production. And the other one is called the Wernicke's area. It governs interpretation of language. Without this area, you can't interpret. You can listen, but you don't understand what the other person is saying. If Broca's area is damaged, you can talk, but you really don't make any sense. You talk gibberish. There is a white matter bundle. Remember I told you that white matter basically is a connecting cable or wires. It's called arcuate fasciculus, which connects Vernix and Broca's area. If this area is damaged, then again, you cannot have perfect language. You may be able to understand, but you may be able to talk, but you can't really understand or interpret what's happening. 